If someone had told me during my school years that the orbit of a planet could look like this, or this, or even this, I would have thought it was something out of science fiction. I would strongly recommend that a person open a school astronomy textbook, which clearly states that each planet moves in an ellipse. And here we see a body rotating around empty space. All these orbits are called halo orbits. They would be impossible if not for the existence of so-called Lagrange points. Let's figure out where they come from and why so many spacecraft have been flying there lately, including James Webb. You are on Ed Valuin. From Newton's laws and the law of universal gravitation, it follows that if we have two bodies interacting with gravitational forces and moving relative to each other, their trajectories will be conic sections, a circle, ellipse, parabola, or hyperbola. If the relative speed of the bodies is small, this system becomes gravitationally bound and remains so for an indefinitely long time, unless influenced by a third body. Thus, these planets or stars will orbit around a common center of mass. If their relative speed is high, they will fly apart along a hyperbolic trajectory infinitely far. However, in reality, it is very rare for only two bodies to interact gravitationally, and scientists often have to consider not two, but many more. For example, the Earth-Moon system. It might seem that the Moon should orbit the Earth in an ellipse, but in reality its orbit is only approximately elliptical and constantly changes, mainly because we have not considered the Sun in this problem, which attracts the Moon two and a half times stronger than our planet does. When flying spacecraft, all major bodies in the solar system must be considered, including the asteroid belt and the moons of the gas giants. Here we come to the most complex part, how to account for a large number of bodies. This is the so-called n-body problem. You have probably heard of its most famous variant, the three-body problem. The essence of it is that if we have two bodies, by considering all initial conditions such as masses, distances, and velocity vectors, we get a system of differential equations, solving which we can determine the positions of the bodies at any moment, even billions of years in the future. The problem is that as soon as we add a third body, problems begin. Such a system behaves extremely unpredictably, and almost identical initial conditions, like the same speeds and masses, lead to very different results. Thus, even the three-body problem, let alone systems with four, five, or fifty bodies, has no analytical solution. That is, we do not have a solution in the form of an equation consisting of sums, multiplications, logarithms, exponentiations, etc into which all parameters of the system can be substituted to predict its behavior in the future. We only have computer simulations. Moreover, in the late 19th century, mathematicians Heinrich Bruns and Henri Poincaré showed the impossibility of finding a general solution to the three-body problem, meaning it's not that we are dumb, but that it's fundamentally impossible to do so. However, one Finnish mathematician, Carl Sundman, found a formal solution in the form of an infinite series of mathematical symbols. These are called series. If all terms of the series could be summed, a solution would be obtained. But Sundman himself proved that this is practically impossible. The series for the motion of three bodies converge so slowly that billions of billions of terms must be summed to get a solution. For example, for the mutual positions of the sun, earth, and moon for the coming year. So there's no mathematical solution for the three-body problem. However, some clever mathematicians said that although there's no general solution, there are particular solutions. The first was Leonard Euler. He found the simplest solution. If three bodies are on the same line, they can orbit the common center of mass without changing orientation. Naturally, there are three such positions. Three Euler points, which provide a particular solution to the three-body problem. Sometime later, French mathematician Lagrange found two more points with the same property. Two massive bodies and one lighter body can be at the vertices of an equilateral triangle and also eternally orbit the common center of mass. This can be, for example, the Sun, Earth, and some small third body like an artificial satellite we send there. But these are partial solutions. The general case still does not have a solution on paper. All that remains is to use computer methods of numerical integration. That is, you sort of divide the movement of three bodies into small segments and calculate the microchanges of the entire system. If the intervals are small and the computer calculates everything accurately, 
The precision of these methods is sufficient for calculating the trajectory of a space mission, or the orbits of planets and their moons. But for anything larger, this method doesn't work because a system of three gravitationally bound bodies is unstable, and even the slightest error over large scales can give a completely incorrect result. And it's impossible to eliminate the error in this method because we assume that time proceeds in jerks rather than smoothly and uniformly. There is another approach. We can assume that the mass of one of the three bodies is much less than the masses of the other two. The orbits of the massive bodies are circular, and the speed of motion along them is constant. Similar conditions are realized, for example, when considering the motion of a satellite or asteroid in the gravitational field of Earth and Moon or Earth and Sun. The mass of this asteroid is too small to affect the orbits of planets, let alone stars. And it turns out that such a system will have five points where a small body can be in equilibrium relative to the other two bodies. These are the combined solutions of Euler and Lagrange. These points are called Lagrange points. Don't think that a body in these points is at rest as if all forces simply balanced each other. The small body rotates together with the massive bodies and completes a full revolution around the system's center of mass in the same time. Thus, the gravitational forces of the massive bodies are balanced by the centrifugal force acting on the small body, but not completely. Otherwise, there would be no movement at all, but just enough for the body to move together with the point. The first three Lagrange points lie on the line connecting the massive bodies. Let's consider the Sun-Earth system and some small body for clarity. But in general, it can be any two massive bodies and one small one. L1 is located between the massive bodies where the attraction of one body is balanced by the attraction of the other and the centrifugal forces arising from the orbital motion. L2 is located on the opposite side of the smaller body, let's say Earth. In this case, the centrifugal force opposes the gravitational pull of both the Sun and Earth. The same is true for L3, but this point is on the opposite side of the Sun. The remaining two points, L4 and L5, are called triangular points. Together with the massive bodies, they form two equilateral triangles and are 60 degrees ahead or behind the Earth's motion in orbit. It might seem that this configuration creates equilibrium since, at the vertices of the triangle, there are very different masses. Actually, nothing is surprising. The Sun is large and pulls our body strongly, while Earth is small and pulls weakly. Thus, the total gravitational pull is directed precisely to the system's center of mass, around which both the Sun, Earth, and our body rotate. Therefore, the centrifugal force will be directed precisely in the opposite direction and can counteract the gravitational pull. Here, it might seem that since we are talking about equilibrium, Lagrange points are such areas where we can launch a satellite, and it will turn off the engine and stay there forever. But this is not entirely true. Let me explain. In physics, there is a concept of stable and unstable equilibrium. For example, if you have a task to place a ball on a curve so that it does not roll off, formally, the solution on the left is correct. But if you slightly touch the ball, it will roll off. However, if a small force acts on the solution on the right, the ball will quickly return to its original position. Therefore, the solution on the right is called stable equilibrium while the one on the left is unstable equilibrium. The same is true for Lagrange points. L1, L2, and L3 are points of unstable equilibrium, meaning if you launch a spacecraft there, its position must constantly be corrected to prevent it from flying away, as in the example with the ball on the hilltop. But points L4 and L5 are points of stable equilibrium, so even if an asteroid without an engine flies there, it will stop there, like a ball at the bottom of a pit lying in it quite stably. We constantly hear about point L2, where so many spacecraft have been sent that it should be crowded there, especially since, unlike L4 and L5, it is not a large area with stable equilibrium but a really small point, and how to stay there. In fact, if we depict the trajectory of a satellite sent to the Lagrange point, we will get quite a tricky curve, or rather curves, as it is a whole family of curves. It is more convenient to draw if we switch to a non-inertial reference frame that rotates with the massive bodies. These orbits arise because, in addition to the gravitational forces from the massive bodies, the satellite is also affected by the Coriolis force and centrifugal forces. Most often, orbits near points L1 and L2 are called halo orbits. You can also hear the term lissajuice orbits. 
The difference is that a Lissajous orbit is quasi-periodic, and the satellite moving along such a complex trajectory does not return to the point from which it started, unlike periodic halo orbits which have a larger amplitude. Therefore, the size of this figure for the Sun-Earth system can exceed a million kilometers. And most importantly, since the equilibrium is unstable, the spacecraft must constantly correct its orbit using engines, or it will fly away. This movement around an empty space is observed only if we switch to a reference frame that rotates with the two bodies. If we look at the solar system from the outside, we will see the third body moving in orbit around the other two. This orbit is just a bit strange. Looking at all these complex trajectories and considering that using points L1 and L2 without engines is generally impossible, someone might ask, why do we fly there at all? Why do we overcome so many difficulties? It turned out that for astronautics and space astronomy, points L1 and L2 are very useful. Imagine you want to launch a space observatory that studies the sun. The telescope lenses should look at the sun and the radio antennas of this space station at the Earth. Here is the advantage of one of the Lagrange points, L1, located between the sun and Earth. The telescope can always be directed towards the sun and the antenna towards the Earth, and you won't need to change this configuration. This point always accompanies the Earth's movement in orbit due to the attraction to the sun and the Earth. The spacecraft makes one orbit around the sun synchronously with the Earth in one year, thus not changing its relative position. Or another situation, you need to send a space observatory where it can maintain easy radio communication, but at the same time, the Earth should be far enough not to interfere. It is easier to maintain radio communication in space if the spacecraft is visible against the night sky, because the sun is a strong source of radio interference. At the same time, it should not move too far from the Earth. And for this, the Lagrange point L2, located behind the Earth on the far side from the sun, is suitable. A space observatory, for example, the Hubble telescope, flies not far from Earth at a distance of 600 calories Khmer from the surface of our planet. The planet does not particularly interfere with it, although sometimes the light from the daytime hemisphere does interfere a little. But if it is an infrared telescope that receives thermal radiation from cosmic objects, the Earth is a big hindrance. If such a telescope flies near the Earth, our warm planet will heat this telescope with its infrared radiation. It will heat up and stop seeing distant warm objects. It will just see itself because it is warm. For this reason, infrared telescopes are sent far away from the Earth, but not so far as to completely lose contact with them. The advantage of the Lagrange point L2 is that it is 1.5 million kilometers from Earth. Radio communication is quite well maintained at this distance. It's not hundreds of millions of kilometers and not tens of thousands of millions of kilometers. The spacecraft is close enough to maintain communication, but far enough so that the Earth does not interfere. Several space observatories operate today at the Lagrange point L2, observing in the infrared, decimeter, and millimeter ranges of the spectrum. When the Earth is a hindrance and the Sun is a hindrance, you need to be farther from them, but still not lose contact with Earth. The peculiarity of this point is that, as I mentioned, points L1 and L2 are points of unstable equilibrium. Therefore, all such space observatories have jet engines that slightly correct the movement of the spacecraft, forcing it to maneuver around the Lagrange point L2 without leaving its vicinity. This is how all space observatories sent their work. They need a reserve of jet fuel. When it runs out, the spacecraft will gradually leave the vicinity of this point. This is not very convenient, so every space observatory has jet engines. Astronomers monitor the position of the spacecraft and turn on the jet engines when needed, correcting its movement. It makes such circular, slightly elongated trajectories around the Lagrange point without leaving its vicinity. This is its advantage and disadvantage. It is not entirely stable. But we put up with it because the work of astronomical instruments there is very useful. From there, we study the relic radiation. We study distant galaxies. For example, the largest space telescope, James Webb, operates precisely in the vicinity of the Lagrange point L2 in the Sun-Earth system. I think in the coming decades, there will be so many space observatories there that it will simply be an astronomical center of Earth's science. Right there, not on the Earth's surface, but 1.5 million kilometers from it. 
The Lagrange points L4 and L5 are also of interest because they are points of stable equilibrium, so an object there does not need an engine to stay there forever. Therefore, a huge number of asteroids usually accumulate there. However, there are no asteroids at the Lagrange points L4 and L5 in the Earth-Sun system because the Earth is too small, and there are few asteroids near the Earth in principle. But in 1956, the so-called Kordilevsky clouds were discovered. These are two clusters of small dust particles located in the areas of L4 and L5 in the Earth-Moon system. However, at the Lagrange points L4 and L5 in the Jupiter-Sun system, there are plenty of asteroids that astronomers have long observed. These asteroids were initially named after heroes of the Trojan War from Greek myths. Moreover, asteroids in L4 were named after Greek heroes, and those in L5 after Trojan heroes. But then so many asteroids were discovered that the myths did not have enough names, and now they just assign them numbers. But the collection of these asteroids is still called Trojans and Greeks. Similar asteroids exist for almost all planets in the solar system. If you want to help a young astrophysical channel, then don't forget to subscribe, hit the notification bell, and give it a thumbs up.